It is my privilege to introduce a woman who has led with integrity, distinction, and uncompromising conviction, Colonel Martha McSally. Well, thanks, Meg. I don't know what to say. I have nothing else to say. <laughs> this concludes our Reagan dinner. Um, but seriously, it is a real honor and a privilege um, to be here tonight and to join you all tonight and to be your guest and to spend a little bit of time uh, just sharing some of my perspectives and to try and inspire and fire you up uh, to whatever you're called to do for the fight for freedom and opportunity in America. Sound like a good plan? Yeah. 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 So, I've already a little bit about my story and um, at the end talked about my dad. And for those, some of you do know my family and a little bit of my story. Um, but I am the youngest of five kids. My mom is here tonight. And my father died when I was 12 years old. And I have three little brothers, brothers and an older sister. And, um, you know, just my life was turned upside down in, in a very uh, short period of time when he had uh, two heart attacks uh, kind of back to back within, a very, within 24 hours. And uh, my life was, was really changed. And like many young people um, who go through tragedies and difficulties as young people, you have to make a choice. Uh, you can ask yourself a lot of questions. You know, why did this happen to me? Uh, why is this happening now? Why, I, I, you know, I don't understand. And uh, I will not say that my road to, uh, through junior high and high school, because we have witnesses in the room, so I need to be honest, you know, was an easy one. Uh, but as I worked through the grief, and as I pressed through the grief, I knew that I wanted to do something that mattered with my life, and I knew I wanted to make a difference. And I had a fire in my belly to make every day matter. And having lost my dad, he was eight, 49 years old, it was implanted to me at a young age that every day is a gift. And we learned that again even in two days ago in Boston. Uh, that every day is a gift and you really don't know uh, when you're going to be taken home. And so um, as we even reflect on that and reminded of that, it's just something that's been the core of who I am. I've lost many friends and colleagues also in combat over the years and so I really try and live that way. A lot of people ask themselves the question, why, all the time? Why does this happen to me? Why can't this change? Why is our country going in this direction? What is going on? Why, why, why? And I'll tell you, the core of my message to you tonight is I am always asking the question, why not? Uh, when they told me that I couldn't fly because I was too short, I said, why not? I had them fit me in a cockpit and showed that my legs were long enough and strong enough and I, they did no kidding, of like a leg strength test of me versus all the other uh, pilot qualified cadets, male and female, and I ended up in the you know, top you know, 90 percentile of that, and we sent up a package and we fought for two years and I wouldn't get off the standing up and down on the desk of the senior uh, colonel in charge of the medical thing, and he finally got on board because it would better be with me than against me, and he decided to ask the bureaucracy the question, why not? Why can't she fly? And after much persistence, I was able to get into pilot training. But at the time, even though we were fighting for this over a couple of years, I had actually broke my hand. And it is a little dorked up still, but uh, without telling you the whole long story, uh, I lost my pilot qualification because of my hand, uh, even though I gained it for my height. And so I was graduating from the Air Force Academy and I decided to apply to get a scholarship. Most people don't apply to the Rhodes Scholarship in order to buy themselves time to get into pilot training, <laughs> but that's actually what I did. And I earned a scholarship to Harvard, and I was at Harvard for two years getting a master's degree. Four surgeries later, uh, switching to left-handed. I even purposed my senior year at the academy that I was gonna throw the javelin left-handed instead of right-handed, and I just decided, why not? Why can't I do that? Why, why is that a problem? Why can't we? And so I just purposed, and I endured, and I just put one foot in front of the other, and I just kept asking the questions, why not, why not? I got my pilot qualification, finally, and went off to pilot training. And I'll tell you, looking back, had I not had that challenge, had I not broken my hand, had I not had to be delayed with the height, had I not then gone to graduate school, I wouldn't have been in a position to be in the group of first seven women to become fighter pilots in the country. Oftentimes you can't see until you look back what, the way things play out and how opportunities came even because of the adversity that you've had, right? So I was in the position, although many were qualified before me, uh, to be the first woman to fly in combat. But I, as Meg mentioned, I mean, I walked around the Air Force Academy saying, I'm going to be a fighter pilot. And they said, you can't. Why not? Because you're a girl. I'm like, that's crap. You know, that needs to change. And they said, well, it's against the law. And I said, well, we live in America. Laws change. And the law is going to change. And I'm going to be ready and postured and in the right place and qualified and capable and ready when the law change. 
And by the grace of God and the work of a lot of other people, I didn't do anything to bring about the change, but I was there when the change happened and I was ready and I was able and I raised my hand and said, here am I, send me, why not? Why can't women be fighter pilots? Just I asked the simple question. I didn't change the law, but I was refusing to take no for an answer. Um, when, when I got stationed over in Saudi Arabia, this was six years into the battle to overcome this policy, which is a US military policy imposed on our own people. It wasn't a Saudi policy, it wasn't a State Department policy. We had over time just decided when women are over here, we just wanted them to sit in the back seat of the car, um, you know, walk with a male escort. They were told to lie and claim the female service member as their wife instead of their fellow service member or their commander. And we were told to put on essentially nearly a burqa. And I had found out about that in my first deployment to Kuwait in 1995, and I thought it was wrong. And I asked, don't we believe in American values? Don't we believe in our Constitution? Don't, are we raising our right hand in the military to defend and support and defend these things? If these things matter to us in America, why not here? Why not here? And I continued to push and push and push up the chain of command. The whole story is an eight-year story. It was six plus years into it when they actually ordered me over to Saudi Arabia, told me to put the burqa on myself and threatened to court-martial me if I didn't wear it. And you don't just wake up in the morning and decide to file McSally versus Donald Rumsfeld in court, right? <laughs> it's a new day. I think I'll see the Secretary of Defense. Yeah, uh, at the time I had been promoted four years ahead of my peers. So I was, you know, two years early to Lieutenant Colonel, two years early to Major, and on paper, you know, on track to continue to be a senior leader. But my oath of office as an officer was to the Constitution of the United States only, against all enemies foreign and domestic. I took that oath very seriously. And so I asked the question again, why not, why not here? Why does this not apply here? And in the end, after filing a lawsuit, I got legislation written, sponsored on both sides of the aisle, and passed unanimously as a freestanding bill in the House of Representatives, as, a, as an amendment to the yearly defense bill in the Senate, and signed into law. It was about eight years. <laughs> um, 